Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. In a world dominated by bad news, it can be hard to remain optimistic, particularly on climate and the environment. My guest today not only manages the challenge, but has become an important voice in communicating why things are not as bad as they seem and why we absolutely must not give up. Dr. Hannah Ritchie is head of research at Our World in Data, and she has a new book, Not the End of the World, which will be out in January and comes strongly recommended by Bill Gates. Please welcome Dr. Hannah Ritchie to Cleaning Up. Before we start, if you're enjoying Cleaning Up, please make sure that you like, subscribe and leave a review. That really helps other people to find us. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favourite podcast platform and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn or Instagram to participate in the discussion. Also, you can visit cleaningup.live to access over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders. And you can subscribe there to our free newsletter. That's cleaningup.live. Cleaningup.live. And if you particularly enjoy an episode, please spread the word, tell your friends and colleagues about it. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gillardini Foundation. So, Hannah, thank you very much for joining us here today on Cleaning Up. Thanks very much for having me. Um, so, could you do the following? Uh, the way we always start is, in your own words, describe sort of who you are and what you do, the short version. So, I'm Hannah Ritchie. I'm an environmental data scientist, you might call me. So, I work at the publication Our World and Data, where we use data and research to show how the world's changing. And we often show these really long term changes on what we frame as the world's largest problems. So I cover mostly environmental stuff, so energy, climate, food, biodiversity. But we also try to link that to human development, so poverty, health, war, peace. Um, and we, we try to use data to understand how the world's changing through these really broad long term trends. And anybody who has been involved in, you know, the climate wars, the energy wars, the, I don't know, the hydrogen wars, you, they will know our world in data because your charts get used as sort of um, the, the, you know, to, to, as a tiebreaker in all sorts of conversations in social media, on Twitter and so on, don't they? Yeah, it's interesting to watch actually people arguing back and forward on different sides of the divide, um, but using our own data charts in the middle. Um, we what's important to know is like we don't produce the data ourselves. Like we we try to we're try almost like a visualization platform. So there's like amazing data providers doing work on this. So Ember Climate, Global Carbon Project, like many different organisations doing work, and we try to like bring the data out um, to make it accessible for people to use in, in policy and and business and to debate on Twitter. So you're, you're a data aggregator and in each of the areas that you cover, you've tried to find sort of the best independent data. Um, and But is it fair to say also that, you know, there's a little bit of a red thread through our world in data's work, which is that kind of things are almost surprisingly better than people think. They're not as bad as you think in many cases, whether it's about literacy or, or um, uh, infant survival or maternal mortality or, or, or democracy. It's actually quite a positive picture that you end up painting. Is that not right? Yeah, I think... I think we're losing this image a little bit, but we, we used to have be framed as like the good news guys because people just saw us, we just like tell good news about the world. I think that's not necessarily how we see ourselves now. Like I think we try to basically show how the world is changing and it just so happens that many, especially the human well-being metrics, so child mortality, maternal mortality, extreme poverty, if you look at the change over the last few centuries, for example, they're all basically heading in a very positive direction. And I think what we, I mean, this also builds on the work of, of gap Minder and Hans Rosling, where if you ask the general public like very basic questions about these long term trends, they tend to get them wrong. Like they tend to be more pessimistic than the data actually shows. And Hans Rosling, um, you know, sadly passed away. He was this great Swedish professor who gave these extraordinary TED talks and, and, and showed how little people understand and, and also showed some of the nuance that even in a developing country, there'll be a sort of middle class, even a, a slow developing country would still have a middle class and, and talked about how, um, you know, population growth has actually nearly topped out. And so, but it did it in an incredible sort of visual way. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, presenting the data in an engaging way is what he did. And he was very good at yeah, tr showing that otherwise very intelligent people and people that think themselves as really well educated often got this stuff very wrong. But like, I think what he was also trying to show was, I think we tend to think of the world as like haves and have nots. So you're either rich or you're poor. And I think one of the key points he was trying to make is that like within a, a middle or low income country, there's a massive difference there. Um, he used to do this trick where they would like stand up on a ladder and he'd say like, us in the rich world, we just look down on everyone as like, you're all poor. But the difference from someone living on one dollar a day to ten dollars a day is is absolutely massive in terms of their living conditions. Um, so there's this yeah there's this really great area in the middle that I think we tend to lose. Right, and so you're doing similar sort of work, communicating and taking the, the best data that there is on on topic after topic. One thing that you sort of, I don't want to say you've been accused of, but because the, maybe it's because the world is just kind of much better than people think. Um, is there a political agenda? Because, you know, you've got all that kind of degrowth and everybody's saying, you know, the world is so screwed that the only response is to slam the brakes on, don't have kids and so on. Um, and, um, and then, you know, certainly, you know, our world in data first came to my attention for actually saying, well, no, you know, and, but you could, you could argue that what it was really saying is actually capitalism works. Is there a political subtext here? Uh, no, I mean, we're, we're very clear that we try to be completely as non-partisan as possible. We don't take sides. We often also try, don't try to build, we often don't try to build specific narratives around the data in a certain sense. We don't try to say, look, this has happened because of capitalism or this has happened because of X. We often try to present the data in a very neutral way and then people start to build narratives around that. And often they'll build different narratives, right? You can give, show someone the same, five people the same chart and they'll, some, they'll find five different narratives around it. So I think what we try to do is present the data as a grounding for a discussion and people then build on that and it's very fair that they then take that in different directions. But I think it's fair to say also that there is this kind of, I don't want to say a dominant narrative, but in some of the circles I move in, it is a dominant narrative that basically the world is screwed and capitalism did it. So that's kind of, you know, the starting point, you know, you can say, oh, well, you know, we just bring the data. But the starting point is that capitalism is, is evil and is trashing the world. And so therefore bringing data is almost a subversive act. Right. I mean, I was in that position a decade or so ago. Like, my background is environmental science, and most of the trends there have largely been moving in the wrong direction. And I think coming from that background, I had just had no idea about any of the positive human well-being trends until I discovered Hans Rosling. But I took the environmental trends getting worse and just extrapolated that. I just assumed, well, of course, poverty was rising, hunger was rising, child deaths were rising. Um, and it was only when I discovered Hans Rosling in the data that like, my perspective on that flipped. So Hans Rosling was the sort of gateway drug, but the uh, but then our world in data, uh, Max Rosa was then, that was where you sort of found your, your home as a data scientist. Yeah. So when I joined, it was 2017 and it was really a team of four of us. Um, so it was very, very small back then. Um, but yeah, Max has done amazing work building the platform and we've just grown from there. Indeed. And, you know, the, um, we're going to get on to you've just written a book which comes out in January. We're going to talk about that and the thesis. But just before we get there, you've also done a TEDx talk. I believe it's TEDx rather than TED. No, was it, it, was, a full... it was Big Ted, yeah. It was Big, big Ted. OK, well, yeah. I, I stand corrected and I, and, and I have even more respect for you than I had before. Um, but um, but you've also written some stuff about how, you know, people should stop telling kids not to have uh, not to have uh, babies. And what, what, what was it called? Um, the, the article, stop telling kids they're going to die of climate change. W yeah. What got you to that point where you want to put your head over the parapet? Because it's also quite an exposed position. Yeah, it is. I think, I think part of it comes from my historical experience. Like I think going back a decade or so, I was definitely in a position having done environmental science where I was kind of locked in this position where I thought the world was just getting worse and worse. I couldn't see any solutions to these environmental problems. I felt very much hopeless and like Possibly I actually didn't have a future left to live for because I was basing it on many of the messages that come through in the media. I think since then it's only continued to get worse. Like I get loads of emails on my inbox from people that are, ex young people especially, that are extremely worried. Like they've given up university because they don't think there's a future there for them. Um, you can see in surveys across the world that a lot of people 
primarily young people, but across the spectrum, are feeling this really deep sense of anxiety. They're feeling extremely doomed. And I think not only is that really poor for people's mental health, but I think it's also just not useful in pushing us forward to solve these problems. So I felt compelled to try to push back against that narrative a bit, not to say that these problems aren't big or they won't have big impacts because they will but I think we shouldn't uh, sink into this this feeling that there's nothing we can do about it and that societal collapse is inevitable because it's not so I'm put in mind as you speak about um, a YouTube video of uh, Rupert Reed who's one of the founders of I don't know Extinction Rebellion and all these good things and he is in a school a school has invited him to speak and I can't tell quite how old the kids are but they feel like about sort of 12 years old something like that and he jumps on a table at the beginning and says I need you to remember this the most important thing the grown-ups have let you down your parents have let you down your teachers have let you down and when you're asked what you want to be when you grow up the correct question is what do you want to be if you grow up this is about whether you have a future. People probably sometimes ask you, what are you going to be when you grow up? But we've reached a point in human history where the question also has to be asked, what are you going to do if you grow up? I'm really, really sorry to have to say this to you. You know, it doesn't feel good. But this is the truth. And I think it's too late for anything but the truth. If you met Rupert Reed, what would you tell him? I mean, I would ask him what on earth he was trying to achieve with that. I mean, I don't see what what are people trying to achieve by telling young kids that message. One, it's not true. And two, it's just not helpful. And in fact, it's very counterproductive. But, but what he's trying to do very clearly, as far as I'm concerned, is recruit kids into Extinction Rebellion, get them to sort of stick themselves to things and, and stop the traffic and do all those things. The situation is now sufficiently desperate that it's not enough anymore to vote the right way. It's not enough anymore to have really great projects in your school. We need to seriously think about which rules we're going to break to draw attention to the crisis. So I was asked when I came here this morning, tell the truth, Rupert, but you mustn't encourage students to break the law. So I'm not going to encourage you to break the law. I'm simply, simply going to draw attention to the fact that sometimes when you do something disruptive, you can get people's attention. Uh, I, I'm not sure if there's anything beyond that that he was really trying to achieve. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to the messaging from Roger Hallam, for example, where I, mean, I think he has a YouTube video, uh, advice to young people facing annihilation or something. Um, and the, in some of his talks, like I remember he gave a talk at Oxford Union where his message, his message was, if you are a young person at university going into business or going into politics or any other industry, then what you're going into is you're complicit in genocide. Like that's how he, he, oh, he termed it. And he talks about the most violent things and says this is the inevitable and near term outcome of, of uh, climate change is societal breakdown. And, you know, and, and, and the, he describes in the most graphic details what he thinks is going to happen. But there's no real basis in science for that, is there? No, and I think I think what he's saying there is the only possible route out of this is um, to go for revolution. And I mean, to me, it's just the, I mean, what it states to me is that that's actually not about climate change at all. Like if we're if we're focused on on tra tra tackling climate change, then we need engineers installing heat pumps, building solar panels, wind turbines. We need people in business and finance pushing for solutions and and backing low carbon technologies. We need people in politics with a backbone that will stand up and set. Um, more ambitious climate targets. I mean, to me, it just it very much states that um, it's actually not necessarily about climate change at all. Right. And the, the thing that I find most ironic about some of these people is that they are the same people who are making these outrageous claims for the near term collapse of society and extreme violence. And then they will say, and, and collapse of the environment as well. And then they'll say, and the worst is the mental health impact on young people. And it's like, well, hang on a second. Who's actually causing that? Is it the world or is it people over trading and over hyping the, 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 the kind of quite bad situation we're in, but not as catastrophic as they make out? Yeah, I think the I think you see the headlines all the time. I mean, I've accused the Guardian of this in the past, where um, I think they have a target of the number of like climate stories that they, a metric of excess is how many 
uh, climate stories they they publish. So it's this like constant barrage of of climate stories, um, and then they they will comment on a new report that's came out about like really high levels on climate anxiety and it's like the circular thing of like yeah because we're 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 also propagating that at the same time now it's to be clear like i think i mean i'm i'm a young still i've considered myself still a young person but i feel anxiety about it i feel worry about it but not to the extent that i felt a decade ago and i think this concern and this worry needs to be balanced with a sense of agency that we can actually do something about it well, so I, I consider myself still a young person and I'm anxious about it. Um, I've got perhaps a little bit, uh, fewer left, fewer years left on the, you know, of the treadmill to run. But, but I am, you know, the, because I think this, it's possible to be, I don't want to say quite anxious, but possibly to be extremely concerned and to get up every day and work on these issues without thinking that it's some near term, as you say, you, you said it in your article, um, without thinking you're going to die of climate change. And there are people who will die, unfortunately, and, and, and hugely, you know, ev- hugely tragic. It's not, you know, because I, when I talk about these things, it's, it, but, sorry, by the way, this is well trodden, um, this is a well trodden path for cleaning up. We've spoken to, um, uh, Johan Rockstrom about how quickly or not quickly the really bad stuff could happen from climate. And the worst things really are kind of in, 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 on a century's time frame, the, the really big feedbacks. Uh, we also spoke to Roger Pelkey Jr., who actually sort of dissected what the IPCC really says, which is nothing like what Rupert Reed and Roger Hallam says, you know, think that it says. So, but it is possible to be very, very concerned, but also realistic about the time frames, and as you say, to have agency. Yeah, I think on the time, I think the time frame stuff is really important. I think there's a lot, a lot of words are thrown around like tipping points, and I think they are. You need to be really um, aware of the time frames we're talking about because I think people, when they hear the term tipping point, they assume that this is a really abrupt change, right? It's like, like the, 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 the film Don't Look Up, right? Which had the asteroid as the, as the analogy for climate change. Like that's not how climate change develops and that's not how tipping points develops. What tipping points are is basically a change, a systemic change in the system a particular system where it's very hard to then reverse that change. But that change can develop over centuries or millennia. And that's the time frame that we're talking about many of these tipping points is developing on. It's not that we hit a tipping point and then five years later, the world goes up in flames. Um, well, I think what's important is the, the time frame for these tipping points to develop is very different from the time frame that we need to act. We still need to act act on the order of, of decades because that locks in essentially the climate path we'll be taking for millennia. Um, but it's not that the impacts then evolve on that same time scale. That's right. And in fact, um, Johan Rockstrom is very surgical about this. And he talks about the um, the commitment time being a few decades when you might commit to a tipping point, but the impact time being potentially a few, in fact, even many centuries, you know, the Antarctic ice sheet, everybody's, oh, it's the, it's the, it's the, the, the sea level bomb. It is. But on the other hand, it's so big and so thick that it actually takes a millennium or more to melt to the point where you get these kind of extreme sea level rises. So he's very good. And we'll put a, we'll put a link in the show notes to his episode because it's so pertinent, um, to the conversation that we just had. Um, so talk to me about, you've got a book, which is coming out in January, where you try to sort of synthesize, and it's not just climate that you're talking about in this book. Talk us through it. Yeah, so my book coming out in January is called Not the End of the World. And yeah, it takes a, a data-driven look at our environmental problems and how to solve them. And it takes problem one by one. So we've got like air pollution, climate, deforestation, food, biodiversity, plastics, overfishing. And chapter by chapter, I try to explain through data, um, how we got to where we are, where we are now, and how we tackle this problem. Um, And the basic framing of the book is not the end of the world, how we can be the first generation to build a sustainable planet. And my main kind of thesis in the book is that we have this, I think we have in our heads that we've only become unsustainable very recently, right? This is over like a post-industrial revolution or even like the last 50 years, we've just suddenly went into this really unsustainable state. And kind of what I try to argue in the book is that actually we've never been sustainable um, in the sense of 
if you think about sustainability as an environmentalist, I often think about it as just this environmental lens of not degrading the environment for future generations or other species. But there's another half to sustainability, which is we also want to provide a good life for people living today. Right. And historically, we've never actually achieved both of those things at the same time. It's been one or the other. So if you go. Yeah. And this is the Grow Harlem Brundtland. Um, I'm not sure exactly the phraseology from the Earth Summit, um, 19, what was it, 1992, yeah, yeah. the Earth Summit, saying that we um, that sustainable development is meeting the needs today without jeopardizing the ability of future generations to live well. Yeah, and I think yeah, and I think there are some controversies around what the definition of sustainability is. Um, people might just want to go for the environmental one, but I like people, and I don't want to see humans suffer. And I also think if you have, if you are to were to make any progress on on tackling environmental problems, I think we need to take people with us. I think it can't be this framed as this one or the other. And what I argue in the book is that we've never achieved both at the same time. So very far back in history, human living standards were low. Like one of the examples I use is that half of children died before reaching puberty. And this was across most of human history. That's now less than 5% globally. And in rich countries, it's much, much lower. Um, over the last few centuries, as we said, we've seen massive improvements in human well-being, but that's come at the cost of the environment. So like the, ta the, the, ta the, the scales have tipped the other way. And what I'm arguing in the book is that going forward, I don't think those two goals are incompatible anymore. I think we can provide a good life for eight, nine, ten billion people and we can tackle our environmental problems at the same time. So, I mean, it's a little bit like Kate Rayworth's donut in that you've got to, the, the outside is don't be unsustainable and the inside is give people social protection and, uh, and, and, and justice and so on. Except that she's essentially saying um, that the problem is capitalism and we've got to slam the brakes on and we've got to increase taxes and tax the wealthy because the real problem is actually rich people. But you don't go there. You avoid that and, and you give examples or at least a, a path that you think is going to be more kind of, that's going to bring people along with these changes and give them agency. Is that right? Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think where I differ there is, um, like I'm quite explicitly against degrowth as a strategy. I think for two reasons. I think one is you can't do global, global degrowth because you leave billions in poverty. Um, and even if you... Even if you only look at that through a climate lens, the people left in poverty are the people that are going to feel the impacts of climate change more strongly. And the way that they become more resilient is to lift themselves out of poverty and become richer. So then you have the question, should rich countries um, go for degrowth? And there, I think, OK, you can be slightly agnostic on GDP growth. I'm, I'm sure there are other metrics that you might want to use measure human progress by. It's not just a GDP lens. Where I don't think that's ever going to go forward is I just don't see it as being politically feasible, especially not on the time scales that we're talking about for actually really getting a grip on global carbon emissions. You're not going to dismantle capitalism and convince the world to go for degrowth in the space of five to 10 years, for example. Um, so to me, like it just doesn't seem a feasible strategy going forward, no. So I, I think that we should be using as metrics a whole range because it's not, I mean, GDP growth is clearly um, doesn't tell us about the quality of our forests or the quality of our teachers or the quality of our motorways or the quality of our savings or nothing, which are very important things. What I would say, though, is those people who want to just move away from GDP, GDP growth correlates with job creation really well. And jobs are really important for everything from, you know, equity, justice, spreading money through the economy, mental health of people and so on. So the only people who ever ask uh, that I've ever seen argue for degrowth is people who've never had to stare unemployment in the face. They've never really understood what it means to have a job or not have a job. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think the I mean, GDP also correlates with lots of other positive things, not just job job creation. I think probably then what they would argue is like you could go for a universal basic income where employment is less important. I mean, I'm not going to advocate for degrowth on this grounds because I, I don't believe in it going forward. Right. And let, let's get back there. So you you then so this is your your thesis is you know we used to be unsustainable because lifestyle was and and you know the, all these terrible indicators of mortality and so on, um, but but at least we didn't have a sort of terrible footprint on the planet. But now we've we've sort of made a lot of progress on the first, on the lifestyle and, and outcomes for humans, but we have had this 
terrible impact. And then you go through, I mean, are you, are you giving a formula for what to do in each of these areas that, that you've outlined from pollution up in the higher atmosphere, then climate all the way down through to the deeps of the sea? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not just a, a let's feel good about where we are book. It's a, it's a how to. It's a, like, this is understanding how we've got to where we are today and actually what that then tells us about how we need to move forward. And so let's, I mean, the one that obviously, you know, this is cleaning up uh, leadership in an age of climate change. So the one that I'm most interested in is climate. Um, let's start there. What, what's the, how does that kind of thesis map onto the, the particulars of climate, which is all about energy and transportation and so on? Yeah, so climate is mostly about energy and also food, but we can take that out for now. So climate is mostly about energy. If you look at historically where we got our energy from, we've never managed to get energy without burning stuff, right? First it was wood, um, and then we moved to fossil fuels. And in both situations, burning stuff, one, creates CO2, and two, creates local air pollution, both of which are bad. We are essentially in the position of being the first generation where we can produce large amounts of energy abundantly, cheaply, without burning stuff, which is good for climate and is good for air pollution. So the, the, the pushback there, I mean, you're the numbers person, so I can come at you with kind of numbers. So you say that we are in a position, marvellous job, you know, you know, pro problem solved. But if you're talking about um, renewables, they are now, well, wind and solar is 15% of global electricity. If you add in hydro, you get to, I don't know, I'm going to guess about uh, almost exactly 30%. And, you know, there's a few bits and pieces like geothermal. They're very small. But that's not job done because, of course, even if it's even if it's 30% that you take as renewable, certainly if it's 15% from wind and solar, that's just electricity, which is only 20% of all energy that we need. So 30% of 20%, 6%. So we've done all of this stuff. My entire career for the last 20 years has been sort of, you know, explaining to people that this is the direction of travel, but we're only 6% in. So we are miles from solving this problem, are we not? I mean, we're far away from solving the problem. It's not that it's solved, but we do have the tools there now to solve it. I mean, I think it's framed as, often framed as, you know, we've, we've spent decades working on this and we're kind of in the same position that we were. I think what's important to note about those decades is that those decades were basically a training. We were basically training to qualify. If you take the example of a sports event, we were training to qualify for the World Cup. Um, and we, that training was trying to get the the cost of these uh, uh, sources down to be competitive with fossil fuels, right? If you're going back 15 years, they were not competitive with fossil fuels. So it was obvious why we weren't deploying them. The cost of these technologies have plummeted. They're now below the cost of fossil fuels. So in some sense, we're just at the base. We're just entering the competition despite working on this for decades. But what that means going forward, so you look at the the the, the curves, um, we might think they might follow like a, I don't know how aware the audience is of like different curve shapes, like an S curve is what we would call it, where you're starting at a very, very low base, but you start to accelerate very, very quickly. And we're just entering the stage of that acceleration. Now, yeah. No, I was just going to, I thought you were, continue, because I, I no, thought you had to stop. Yeah, no, so we're starting from a very low base. We can expect that those sources will grow very quickly. And I think what's also really important to note is that we're, there we're looking at an energy system on the basis of primary energy demand. And I think what's important to note is that most of that energy is completely wasted. Like it's not actually going towards energy services is what, is, is what we actually want. So if you take a, a ballpark figure, it's around two thirds of the primary energy is wasted. And then if you think about it in terms of final energy demand, which is closer to the amount of energy that we might actually use, there's another step, but we can ignore that, final energy demand. So um, recently there's a paper by uh, Nick Ayer at Oxford looking at if you take the global energy system today and if you just electrify it, right, you electrify it and you maybe go for hydrogen and some of the really hard to abate sectors, final energy demand would drop by 40%. So electrification takes out many of the inefficiencies that we have in the current system. And a way to explain that is to take like a car, for example. So a standard petrol car, you put a pound of petrol in, 20 pence of that actually goes to moving the car. 80 pence of that is wasted. If you take an electric car, it's almost the flip of that. So you maybe get around 20%, 20p is wasted, but 80 
ATP actually goes into moving you, which is what you want. You just want to move from A to B. So that means that the energy you would need to move the same distance in an electric car is three to four times less than in a petrol car. So once you start to electrify these sectors, a lot of these massive inefficiencies go away and our actual energy demand in the end will be much lower than the big stack of energy that we're looking at today. Now, look, you're, you're, um, you're, I don't know what I would say, singing from my song sheet. This is absolutely, um, this is one of the things that gives me hope is that there is so much waste in the system. And in fact, um, we did, we've done two episodes with Jonathan Maxwell, CEO of SDCL, Sustainable Development Capital. And he's the f- premier investor in this kind of, you know, resolving energy efficiency. If we just, if we could just stop being so inefficient, then we would already have solved two thirds of our problems. And in fact, there's lots of nice things like 40% of all shipping actually is moving, uh, iron ore, gas, um, and, and coal around the world and oil around the world. So, you know, if you do go to a clean system, then you also reduce lots of the kind of uh, the 15% of energy goes to actually extracting fossil fuels. So there's lots of different ways in which the kind of the system starts to help you once you get past that, that tipping point. Yeah, I think the, I think like, uh, Similar to the the degrowth conversation, I think there's lots of focus on trying to reduce energy demand from a consumer side. And that's looking at standard like energy efficiency stuff or actually just cutting out stuff that people want to use. And I think to me, behaviour change is very hard in that domain. And I think we might see some gains there, but I think they will be fairly marginal. I think what we're completely missing from the conversation is, is exactly this, that even if you keep the amount of energy services that people want the same, you can you can massively cut the amount of energy that you demand. So, so you you avoided earlier. You said there's primary energy, final energy, and something else, but I won't go there. But you did go there then, which is energy services, and I think that's really important for this audience. That what you've got is primary energy is how much coal you dig out of the ground, how much oil you get out of the ground, how much gas you get out of the ground. Final energy is what you sell to a user. But they don't use all of it because they have inefficiency as well. In that example of the car, they stick the petrol in their petrol tank and then use 20% of it to actually drive. And the, what we really need is energy services. And that's, I think that is just such an important message because I think that human well-being, human activity, human, everything we do correlates with those energy services. Energy services is actually when you go and you visit your grandma, you know, whether you do it by train or car or walk or the energy service is what you need to do that or the light that you need for your homework or whatever it is that I think we want to increase enormously because it correlates with all the good things in life. But that doesn't mean either final energy or certainly not primary energy. Those can go down. I, I, and they should because that's those are the ones that's what gives the, the horrendous environmental impact. So I don't know. I think we're we're furiously agreeing. We could go off on a sort of on a conversation about that. But uh, but it's so important that people understand how little of the coal that we dig out of the ground ends up doing anything useful for us. Yeah, so like we can we can globally we can increase the amount of energy service seas that we're getting without increasing the total amount of energy that we're burning. And it does astonish me, by the way, how few of the I mean you get these kind of generalist commentators. I'm talking about people like Bjorn Lomborg, um, even Vaclav Smil, who don't seem to understand. And Lomborg repeatedly talks about primary energy. You know, we renewables will never be able to meet the need for primary energy. It's like, well, they don't need to, because that's mainly waste. Two thirds of it's wasted. I don't understand how he continues with that. I mean, because it makes renewables look bad, right? Like there's often like a motive behind it. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're right. The motivate. In fact, the answer to the question is pretty simple. Um, but what do you say to come back at you though? What do you say to those who say, "Well, there's not enough minerals," uh, and and that that you know we're going to replace an over dependence, an unsustainable dependence on fossil fuel with a, an absurd. Uh, volume of required extraction of minerals with inevitable environmental planetary consequences. Yeah, I think, I mean, I will come back specifically to your question. I think I think where I see some danger in this space is that I think people are often looking for perfect solutions that don't exist. I think, 
I think the reality is we're not going to find any alternatives that don't require some land, don't require some inputs, don't have small amounts of waste. Like, and if we're looking for those solutions, like they're not there. And I think one of the dangers is that we slow this process down because we're unwilling to accept that there will be small trade-offs and there will be some small impact. I think you need to take the counterfactual of, is this much, much better than the alternative of continuing to burn fossil fuels? But yeah, on, in terms of, of mineral demand, yes, it's true that we will require a large amount of minerals. Um, I think even there, you need to put a little bit into context. How does that compare with the 15 billion tonnes of fossil fuels that we're hauling out the ground every single year? And actually, there's been some recent papers on this looking at how will the total material requirements, which is the, the minerals, the fossil fuels, and also the waste rock that you would take out from trying to extract those, how will that change through decarbonisation? And I actually think people assume that it would increase but several of these papers have shown that in a decarbonised world, that is going to go down. So our total material requirements are going to go down. But we are going to move to a wide and diverse range of minerals with um, could be large impact. On the question of are we going to run out, from the studies that I've seen long term, no one seems to be coming to the conclusion that we're going to run out. So there's... Uh, the Energy Transition Commission um, did a big report on this. That wasn't the conclusion. Um, there's Morgan Bazillion at the um, Payne Institute who does great work on this. I have never seen him say that we're going to run out. Um, there's a paper earlier this year by um, Sever Wang and Zeke Cow's father and um, several others looking at material requirements in the electricity system. Again, they did not come to that conclusion. So I think the, the general consensus is that long term total material demand is not the issue. I think there are certain issues that we need to illustrate. One is, is short-term um, supply and demand, where in the short term, we could possibly hit severe bottlenecks just because we're not uh, managing to scale up our mining and refining capacity um, quickly enough. Um, and then there are obviously geopolitical issues around that we, we cannot ignore. So yeah, long-term, I'm not concerned. Short-term, I think there are a range of risks so I could add to the list of studies that have said there is no long-term shortage. The IEA has done great work. Bloomberg New Energy Finance has done great work. Morgan Basilium, whom you, whom you mentioned, was actually one of the early guests on this show. And um, Lord Turner, Adair Turner, has already been on once and is coming on uh, again shortly, just to be our last uh, episode before Christmas. But there is a rate-limiting problem in that, you know, we do have to scale up the mining but also, what is what is your responsibility or what is your response when people say, well, what you're sort of saying is, OK, we're going to move to a climate safe, clean future and you can't make uh, an omelette without breaking some eggs. There's going there's nothing perfect. But the problem is that those eggs that are going to get broken will be in Papua New Guinea. They'll be in Bolivia. They'll be in, you know, places that are mineral rich and governance poor, but will be OK in the wealthy world. You know, we'll be nice. We're the, we'll stop emitting. But or you know, another one would be DRC, the Congo, where there might be some appalling impacts locally. Uh, what is your response to them and what is our responsibilities of advocates for this you know, dramatic increase in mining? Yeah, I mean, it's a, a good question. I mean, the point is we can't just um, take move away from one system and move to another system that's incredibly damaging socially and environmentally. Um, I think the response there is that it is a challenge to create sustainable supply chains in many of these minerals, but it's a challenge and we need to take responsibility for that. Um, I don't, I, I see it as a significant challenge and problem, but I don't see it as an insurmountable one. And then I think I think I mean I think it depends a little bit on the local example local examples. I think there are probably significant room for technological innovation to actually specifically move away from areas that are poor governance, um, geopolitically unstable. Like the, the example of cobalt that that you gave, I I think it's possibly inevitable that we many manufacturers move away from cobalt in batteries, like we've seen that with Tesla, um, who are starting to move away from cobalt. Um, so I think there will be possibly innovations that will move us away from certain supply chains where there is just large polit geopolitical risk. 
So I would like to think, maybe I'm being um, sort of Pollyanna-ish, I would like to think that rather than just kind of say, well, you know, DRC is impossible and we'll move away, we'll technically, we'll technologically innovate, you know, that, that, that DRC would become wealthier, the governance would improve to the point where, because we've dealt with this with the clothing industry, you know, horrendous abuses, but then you get to the point where, you know, the Bangladeshis of the world, uh, the Vietnams of the world, they're actually becoming wealthier and better, better governed and better able to protect themselves and also all of the activists and the supply chain work, um, you know, that, that actually, because, you know, the, a response that says DRC is so awful, we're going to just kind of cut it off from the economic system is also not appropriate. No, and I've I've written an article um, previously on looking specifically at the the cobalt issue in DRC, and yeah, the conclusion I came to was the same that I actually think for the DRC just as ab uh, like abandoning cobalt in, in EVs and moving to something else is actually very bad for DRC. I mean, I think there you've got the situation where the majority of the population live under the international poverty line, so under. Two dollars a day, um, and and uh, child labour rates are 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 a problem in artisanal mining in particular. But the reason the kids are in the mine and not in the school is because because the family is in such deep poverty that they've literally got no other option. Um, and actually, by moving supply chains away from DRC, you're actually taking out the rug from beneath them, and actually they probably fall then below the poverty line. So a much better approach would be to say. We're going to massively improve supply chains in DRC. We're going to not allow child labour. We're going to provide better finance so they're not living on $2 a day. Um, but I'm actually quite afraid that actually we, that just seems too hard and technological change is often easier than doing um, social, social change. I mean, in a sense, the good news is that, the, you know, if it is net zero 2050 we're talking about, there are 27 years. So these, it's not like we're, every problem is going to be or has to be solved overnight. What I'd like to do is you've got in your book, it's not just climate, you've got these other areas. Can we do sort of, we've talked a little bit about air pollution uh, along the way, as we talked about climate and energy, but can we rapid fire talk about some of the other ones that interact so the the closest interactions i think there's food deforestation plastics you then get into biodiversity and overfishing but let's do rapid fire let's start with food what's the thesis in the book what will people be uh, reading about if they you know when they buy your book which they will uh, in the chapters on food okay so early food um huge pressure on wild animal populations so you saw actually really significant declines in large mammals in particular through overhunting and various other um, clashes with animals. Then we moved to farming. The problem with farming for most of its history is that yields were extremely low, right? We had no way to increase crop yields. What that means is if we wanted to grow more food, we just had to use more and more and more land, which links into deforestation. So you start to deforest, um, result in, white, in large habitat loss because you can't increase yields. Over the last century or so, we've managed to massively increase yields. And we're talking about like a tripling, quadrupling, depending on the country. We're now in a position where we could feed 10 billion people easily on much, much, much less land than we currently do. We could regrow forests, we could give um, wildlife back its habitat, and we could still feed 10 billion people at the same time. But, I mean, is this just a, an advertisement for more and more fertiliser use? Because, I mean, fertiliser, we've done that using fossil fertiliser. We've partly done that for a fertiliser. Like, it's been, like, um, the Haber brush process and being able to create synthetic um, nitrogen in particular was, like, a key unlocking of this. But it hasn't been the only driver. And I think we have reached the point... global. So if you look at global trends in fertiliser use... Since 1960, they've approximately quadrupled, right? So large increases in fertilizer use. Over the last five or so years, rates have not really increased. We're using about the same amount of fertilizer. Now, I don't want to call a definite peak, but we're kind of reaching yeah. this kind of plateauing. We've seen in rich countries in particular that we can produce more food while reducing fertilizer use. So UK fertilizer use is down by about a third. We've seen the same across Europe. You actually see now a drop in China. US fertilizer is where it was in the 1970s. So we are starting to see this decoupling where it can produce more and more using less and less fertilizer. An, an, an astonishing proportion of fertilizer is wasted. It just becomes runoff and it either just sublimates, I think, into the air or it goes into the rivers in, and into the streams, rivers and sea. I mean, it's some enormous, like 40%, 50%, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, if we go to 
clean fertilizer, which could well be more expensive, we're likely to be more frugal in our use of fertilizer. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just one additional point there is like the mass, a massive driver um, of, of food impacts impacts globally is uh, meat and meat and dairy yeah. production and consumption. And they are, again, we might be a wee bit off from this, but we are in a position where we could produce protein, we could produce synthetic fats, basically with no land at all. Like we could, ma and again, we would have no fertilizer, no manure running off into the oceans. So we, we are in a position where we could produce lots of food without using much land. We did an episode uh, with Jim Mellon, of, on, of agronomics on exactly that issue of uh, synthetic food, synthetic pro, uh, proteins and so on. Just while we are on food, is there any sign of what Rupert Reed and uh, Roger Hallam would no doubt be delighted to see, which is some sort of collapse in harvest and yield due to climate so far? No collapse, no. If you look at future projections, we would expect that um, holding everything else constant in certain regions, increased temperature will reduce yields. That's what we expect. That's when holding everything. Holding yeah. everything con constant means no adaptation. Is that correct? No adaptation. And you might be able to argue that some of these um, impacts you could offset with different uh, crop varieties, more irrigation, maybe more fertilizer. Um, so, yeah, there are potential ways that we could mitigate a lot of those, uh, sorry, adapt to a lot of those impacts. So we do expect in the future that we'll see crop yield declines. And that would be, that's actually one of my biggest concerns when it comes to climate change. As to where we are today, we're still recording record harvests. Like this year has been an extremely hot year. We've seen lots of impacts um, across the world. We're still recording basically record harvests this year. So that's an interesting version of the um, of the early Simon bet might be whether crop yields are higher in 10 years or lower in 10 years. Um, and you're saying that you would not accept that bet. You, you would you might you might be concerned and think they could be lower. I think they could be lower. Yes. That's an interesting one. I'm wondering whether we should bet because I'm pretty sure they'll be higher. Maybe not, you know, but we'd have to define the bet very carefully because yeah. single it, years can bounce around, obviously. I think it also depends on like where you're talking about. I think there's some regions where you can, there's still a lot of room for yield growth. There's like a lot of what we call the yield gap of like where yields are and where they could be with more inputs, more irrigation, etc. I think for some regions that's big. I think for other regions like North America, for example, or maybe Europe, I think we might start to see like a plateau of yields oh, on a regional basis and as i say year by year it'll bounce around i just um you know i i i think what because what's interesting is if you summarize the first part of the conversation about things not being as bad as as made out is that fundamentally there is a race between adaptation and climate change and until now just in terms of numbers of people um you know uh, killed by uh, weather related disasters or whether it's the harvests and yields and so on up till now, adaptation is winning. Quite clearly in your data, the kind of the, the, the world in data figures would show that adaptation up till now is winning. And I suppose what you're saying is, hmm, you know, not necessarily forever, though. Yeah, I think, mean, yeah, historically and up to now, um, adaptation and resilience is, is winning. Um, I would be always be cautious about extrapolating that to assume that it's going to be that way in 10 or 20 years. Yeah, who knows? We might need some huge climate model or something like that to decide. <laughs> Let, let's just do our rapid fire deforestation. I want to cover a couple more deforestation. Where are we, and uh, what are you saying on in the chapters on deforestation? So deforestation, since the end of the last ice age, we've cut down around a third of the world's forests. Now, half of that was pre-1900, and we've seen a big acceleration over the last century or so. So half of that is post-1900. You, you tend to see this general trend in deforestation where rich countries in particular, so if you take the UK, for example, we cut down our forests centuries ago. Um, we cut down, I think, so Scotland, for example, was about 20% forested. That went all the way down to 5%. So we cut down three quarters of our forest. And now that is rebounding. So you tend to see this general trend where countries cut down their forests, they reach this low point, and then it starts to reforest again. What that means is that globally... Temperate regions have already peaked 
in, in deforestation and it's falling naturally we're regrowing forests so most of the deforestation that's happening in the world is in tropical regions and the primary driver of that is as we just discussed is agriculture so it's mostly about farming it's about clearing forests to produce um, either grazing land or croplands and the argument there is that we could get deforestation very close to zero largely through um, dietary change or improvements in agricultural productivity. And are we net today, are we net adding or net still losing wood mass in woodlands, in forests? We are still net losing. Still net losing, but it's become much, much, the rate of that has become much slower, has it not? Yeah, so global, if you look at FAO figures, uh, sorry, UN Food and Agriculture Organization, um, global deforestation peaked in the 1980s and it's been slowly declining since then, but it's it's still very high. I have to ask you, in your book, do you deal with population as well? Because, you know, it's a dangerous subject. As soon as you say, well, kind of obviously we had a bigger impact because population grew, then people start to immediately say, aha, you're one of these people who wants to control and one child per family and, and, and you're very, and eugenics. And there's a horrible discussion that people try and impose on you the moment you, you know, mention the word population. And, you know, I, I tend, you know, I, I think you've said it. I like, you like people. I like people. So I'm not one of these people who thinks that population holds the key, but do you have a discussion of population in your book? Yes, I do. So that each of the chapters are tackling one environmental problem after another. What I do at the beginning of the book is tackle two arguments that are like more sweeping ones. They're not engaging with the specific problem. It's just the problem is population or the popula- or the problem is economic growth. And I basically say, we're not going to tackle this through population change. We're not going to tackle this through degrowth. Um, I mean, I think on population, the story there is, um, yes, probably impacts would be lower if we had a population of one billion. Of course they would. But in terms of where we are today and how we're moving forward, global population is going to, like, I think people assume that population is still rising exponentially. It's not rising exponentially. Um, in many regions, population is going to decline. And globally, the latest projections from the UN is that um, population will peak in around the 2080s. Um, so, and, and the question is, if you wanted to tweak that population number, like if you look at the pace of demographic change, you're not going to manage to shift that significantly with if any, any major intervention. And, and in fact, there's a whole load of um, of research and, and uh, modelling stuff that just says, well, even if you wanted to shift it, the best way to do it is to educate women, uh, which has all sorts of other environmental and social benefits. So it's kind of, you know, I don't think one has to go directly for population. You just have to kind of solve the problems, the, the, the real problems of uh, the impacts and uh, and that will solve itself. Yeah, yeah as um, I say in the book... Um yeah, the fertility rates tend to decline as women move into education, they get access to yeah. contraception. Um, the point is we should be advocating for that anyway, and we don't need a climate argument built on top of that. We should just do it because that's the right thing it's to the do. Right, it's the right thing to do, um, uh, exactly. Um, the last one of the major topics in your book that I just want to touch on, plastics. Right, We hear a lot about plastics. You know, we could solve the climate issue. And I suspect that the people who don't want to be happy will move seamlessly on to saying that, ah, but the big problem is plastics. Yeah, so I'm quite specific in my book that I'm tackling the problem of plastic pollution, um, which is the big pictures of uh, plastics flowing out into rivers and flowing out into the ocean. What I'm not tackling in the book is how to end plastic use. Um, and one, because I don't think that's desirable and I think it has lots of negative consequences and two I just don't know how to do that but the problem of plastic pollution is a very very tractable one so um, I think we often overestimate the amount of plastic that's going into the ocean so about 0.5 percent of the plastic waste we produce each year um, goes into the ocean that's the the recent estimates now that's a very tractable problem the problem of plastic is not plastic use it's plastic waste management right it's a waste management management problem and most of the plastic that's flowing into the ocean is coming from lower middle income countries where they've 
developed rapidly, so plastic use has increased, but waste management has not managed to keep up. So they've got lots of using lots of plastics without waste management to to um, to put it into landfill or recycle it or to incinerate it. Now, if we wanted to solve that in the next five to ten years, we could easily do that, right? We just put money into to waste management and the problems solved. Um, some of the issue I take is that. I think often people see this plastic pollution problem and their first go-to is we need to stop using plastic. And the point is, like, to solve the 0.5% of plastic problem, you're not going to get there by tackling the top of that chain, right? You could probably half plastic use and it might not actually have any impact at all on the amount of plastic that's flowing into the ocean. So what I'm arguing for is if your concern is plastic pollution, do a really targeted focus on that 0.5% instead of focusing on the 300 million tonnes that we, we use each year. So your figure of 0.5%, and that's the stuff that's sort of flowing down the rivers and into the garbage, the great garbage patches. Um, and, I, and I agree with you. I mean, plastic, the problem, you get rid of plastic and immediately you have, you have an increase in food waste. Um, so, that, you know, it's a very, um, we use plastics for a reason and, uh, and it's not in the, the, the it's not clear that just stopping using plastics would be good for the environment. In fact, it's fairly clear that it wouldn't be. But you're talking about the, you're talking there about the plastic that flows into the seas. What about microplastics, which are so pervasive? And I don't know whether it's, you know, half a percent of plastic that ends up as microplastics, but we do know that they are all over the place. They're in the Antarctic, the Arctic, the deep sea, the, the deserts. They're on the glasses. They're in our bodies. They're in our brains. They're in my testicles. They're in, they're, they're everywhere. And surely you have to have some concern about that. I have some concern about that. I mean, you're right that microplastics are now everywhere. I have some concern about that, but concern because it's un unknown known, right? We actually, we don't know what the impacts of plastics are. So far, there has not been a large body of evidence saying that there are negative impacts on human health from microplastics. In fact, there was a, there was a, a big review by the WHO last year that came out looking at what's the evidence for um, negative health impacts of microplastics. And the conclusion was there's insufficient evidence to say anything, which does not mean that there are no impacts, but we haven't seen any significant ones to date. But, but if you type into Google Scholar, um, microplastics endocrine, because some of these, it, the plastics may not themselves disrupt endocrine function, but a lot of the surfactants, a lot of the chemicals that are used to change the characteristics of the plastic, make it hard, make it soft, make it biodegrade, those chemicals do have endocrine uh, and, and that's, I mean, that's been shown in, in animal trials, in models. Uh, it doesn't look good. Uh, um, animal models and trials does not necessarily mean that you see those impacts in the real world. Like I'm not, I'm not saying that there are no imp negative impacts. Like I say explicitly in the book, this is like an open area of research, and I actually think it's a underinvested area of research because if this is a major problem, then we're, we're actually quite screwed, and we need to get working on it now. Um, but so far, there has been very limited evidence on the negative um, health impacts of microplastics. But doesn't this raise one of the really big sort of issues, one of the big problems, um, which is that supposing there were some negatives of microplastics or there are some negatives of plastics, they end up in the in you know, some proportion is always going to end up in the sea. How do we conduct the discussion that says that the benefits are so overwhelmingly large? And of course, you know, fossil fuel advocates will say, well, yeah, there might be a bit of climate change, but there's no really, if you go through the IPCC results, as I did with Roger Pelkey in his episode, the actual negatives to date of climate change, which are real, but they're still relatively minor compared to the vast increases in human you know health wealth happiness uh, that, that have emerged from fossil fuels so how do we conduct a discussion how do we manage those trade-offs between some disadvantages and some potentially very substantial advantages society seems ill-equipped to have that discussion yeah i mean it's 
it's difficult and you will often get different answers like from different people on what the trade-offs and priorities should be. I think on the, the climate question, I think I think there was some legitimacy to that argument when you didn't have viable alternatives to fossil fuels, right? There it was a question of you either burn fossil fuels or wood or you have no energy at all. And we want energy because energy is really important for human development. The position we're in now is that there's no longer that trade-off, right? We have alternatives. And I mean, you might argue the same for for plastics. I mean, it would depend on what is the magnitude on human health. If there's enormous impacts on human health, then yeah, you would be like, we need to stop using plastics. If it's small impacts, there then the question is, are there alternatives to plastics where the benefits would justify ending the use of plastics. So I think it's a, it's, 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 it's a difficult question, but it's about are there alternatives that you'd switch to and weighing up what are the, the pros and cons on either side. And in fact, you know, I could even, I could take, I could play devil's advocate. I could also argue against myself and say, in fact, society's quite good at making those choices. We've done it time and time again. You know, when we discovered about the ozone hole, when we discovered about DDT, and there's a sort of societal process which ends up with a decision. And I, I suppose, you know, you would argue that your book is part of that process and that, you know, it's, it's not kind of, we don't live in a, a single global dictatorship where one person decides there's a societal you know, engagement that ends up moving us forwards. Okay, I'm going to be the devil's advocate on you know, and then, but I think there you need to be cognizant of who's making the decisions, right? Because here you're talking about global problems where the impacts are very felt very differently across the world. So it's it's not necessarily the poorest countries that are going to be hit by climate change are not making the decisions about how much fossil fuels we're burning. Damn, it's usually me who gets to sort of claim the moral high ground and say that we've got to be very careful about issues of justice and, uh, you know, particularly as, uh, uh, you know, in a, you know, I don't want to say a post-colonial, but a world struggling to kind of heal after colonialism. We do have to be, you're right, absolutely. What I was going to do with that comment about your book being part of this discussion was I was actually going to ask uh, us to wrap up by you giving a very explicit plug for your book. What's it called? When does it come out? How can people buy it? Yeah. Uh, my book, Not the End of the World, is out in January. It takes a data-driven but optimistic look at how we can solve our environmental problems while improving human well-being at the same time. And you can buy it at all good retailers. Very good. Hannah, it's been a huge pleasure speaking with you. Thanks very much, Michael. Thank you. Bye-bye. So that was Dr. Hannah Ritchie, Head of Research at Our World in Data and author of a new book, Not the End of the World, which will be out in January next year. As always, we will include links in the show notes to the episodes mentioned during our conversation. So that's episode 93 with Roger Pelkey Jr., Inconvenient Truth About Climate Science, episode 49 with Johan Rockstrom, Pushing Planetary Boundaries, episode 13 with Morgan Bazilian, the poet of the low carbon transition, episode 110 with Lord Turner, that's Adair Turner, Lord of the Net Zero Transition. And you should also look out for the episode we'll be recording at the end of this year to close season 10 with Lord Turner. And episode 136 with Jim Mellon, from Moore's Law to Moo's Law. We will also include in the show notes links to Hannah's TED Talk, her Wired piece, Stop Telling Kids They'll Die from Climate Change, and to some of Rupert Reed and Roger Hallam's most egregious scaremongering. And, of course, we'll also include a link to Hannah's upcoming book, that's Not the End of the World, which I'm sure you'll want to pre-order. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share and subscribe to Cleaning Up or leave us a review on your chosen podcast platform. And do please, please spread the word on social media or by telling your friends and colleagues. And if you want more from Cleaning Up, sign up for our free newsletter at cleaningup.live, where you'll find our archive of over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gillardini Foundation.